Good, good, I was going to say good morning, so that means I'm not ready. Okay. <laughs> good evening. Welcome to our Bible study as we're going through the book of Ezekiel. I have to say when uh, people wanted us to go through the book of Ezekiel, I was a little apprehensive because it's one of those books that's very dense. You have to unpack it. You have to uh, search a lot of scriptures. You have to look at every word because as we'll see in this lesson, God interjects some words in the, through the prophecies of Ezekiel that has you going in a completely different direction. So that's what we're going to do this evening. But so far as we are studying through the book of Ezekiel, what's the tone of the book of Ezekiel so far? It's one of, one of judgment. One of what? God is calling out Israel's sin. God is calling out the iniquity of his people, the idolatry of his people. And now we're going to look at how God is going to judge his people. But last week, for a brief moment, we looked at the restoration of Israel. And one thing we said about the book right now is we're progressing through the book of Ezekiel. We'll see the tone is going to beginning is going to change a little bit. So God's going to start talking more and more about the restoration of Israel as we get through, uh, through the book. And in this lesson, we're going to look at uh, more judgment that God's going to pronounce. But here and there, he's going to give us glimpses of the millennial kingdom. And how does the book culminate in? How does the book of Ezekiel culminate? How does it finish? How does the book of Ezekiel finish? Last eight chapters of the book. The Millennial Kingdom, actually nine, if you include chapter 40, talks about the Millennial Kingdom completely. Nine chapters devoted to the Millennial Kingdom. So today, uh, God says that one day he will rule over Israel and Israel will be back into the land. Now today we see many Jews returning back into the land. Do you think Israel is really returning back into the land as we looked at last week's lesson? No, some of them are. And in fact, if you look at the land of Israel, uh, they're only controlling barely 10% or a little over 10% of the entire land that God gave them. And if you want to see the extent of the land of Israel, you look at, the, uh, look at Genesis lesson 12. God clearly in the Bible defines the boundaries of Israel. Who can tell me the two rivers that define the, the boundaries of Israel? Two seas and two rivers. Go ahead. Uh, the Nile and the Euphrates. The, the river of Egypt. Many people think the river of Egypt is the Nile. But it's actually a river that splits the Sinai Peninsula down the middle. So now, good. I'm glad you brought it up. So why do people think it's the Nile River? Because it's a river in Egypt. Because it said the river in Egypt, right. But if you look at the Bible, what does the Bible call the Nile River? The Nile. Okay. So the Bible distinguishes the Nile River from the river of Egypt. And what is the other river? The river Euphrates. And what are the two seas that define the boundaries of Israel? The Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. Good. And the north, who knows what the north is called? The land of? Israel. Begins with an H. The north of Israel. I'm trying to test the geography here a little bit. H-A. That's where Nebuchadnezzar judged Zedekiah. The land of? Hamath. And then the east is defined by? One word. It's a desert, right, it's a desert, it's a Syrian desert. So we have the, God clearly defines the land of Israel. And if you look at Israel today, what does everybody say? Oh, they're, they're occupying the Palestinians' land. Uh, no, it's not, it's the other way around. Right. You're occupying Israel's land. If you look at the, we have the boundaries in Lesson 12. And what's going to happen, what's the trap that Israel's going to fall into, the tribulation? They're going to give a little bit more land. They're going to give the little bit of land that they have for what? Peace. For peace. For a false peace. And you read that in Joel chapter 3 verse 2. And God's going to be angry at that. So he's angry with his people. Uh, he has not finished punishing Israel. He's going to continue punishing Israel. Until the point they come. Uh, they acknowledge that God is their God. Regarding this chapter. Charles Feinberg said. No chapter in the Bible speaks more prominently. And fully of the sword of the Lord. Than does this chapter. Which has been called the sword song. Or the prophecy of the sword. And that's true. Ezekiel chapter 21 has the word, has, mentions the word sword more than any other chapter in the scriptures. Uh, people think God is a pacifist. We have some people that whole denominations build around pacifism. Is God a pacifist? Yeah. No. What does he call himself in Exodus 15.3? The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. In Luke chapter 20, 22 verse 36, Then he said unto them, after Christ was leaving his disciples, but now he that hath a purse, don't, don't mistake that for a man purse, he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise a script, but he that hath no sword, 
let him sell his garment and buy one. I remember I was in a church years ago. Remember, I'm from Canada. Uh, so I went to a church in the United States, and the pastor was preaching, and he says, if you don't have a gun, sell your couch and buy you one. So I, that's what I did. I, I didn't sell my couch. But, but that's people think it's wrong to have guns. How many of you guys have heard that? It's not. God, the, the right to self-defense is not a right to self-defense. It's a God-given right. It's a divine right. It's a divine right. We, God has allowed, allowed us to defend ourselves. So now let's continue on in chapter 21. Here in verse, we're going to pick up in verse 1. And God is going to judge Jerusalem and the temple. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face toward Jerusalem, and drop thy word toward the holy places, and prophesy against the land of Israel. And say to the land of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, and will draw forth my sword. See, who has a sword here? God. God. Don't forget that. God has a sword. The angels do not have wings, but who has wings? God does. God has wings. And will draw forth my sword out of his sheath, and will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked. The first time we hear that in the book of Ezekiel. Seeing then that I will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked, therefore shall my sword go forth out of his sheath against all flesh, from the south to the north, that all flesh may know that I, the Lord, have drawn forth my sword out of his sheath. It shall not return any more. So when God says, I am against thee, what do you think is going to happen to that country? Exactly. Uh, Gog is against one country. Twice he says it. Which country he's against? Big time. Both Ezekiel. Who? who? Gog and Magog. I'm against thee, O God. God says that, God says that twice. He said, God. So, oops. so who is God? Putin. Putin is God. No, no. The leader of Russia is Gog in the Bible. So God says, I am against thee. So you have these people that are saying, oh, they're in love with Putin. Uh, if God is against you, I don't care who you are, what you're doing, what you're saying you're doing. Uh, if God is against you, guess what? I'm against you too. So God is against God. God here says he's against the land. And as we've seen in previous lessons, uh, when God says he's against the land, what is he really saying? He's saying that the land has been polluted by the blood and the sins of the people and God has no choice. But now he has to judge the land. And I'm afraid America is heading, heading, that, heading that way because there's going to come a time God's going to say against the sin of America, enough's enough. And I believe he's going to have to judge us for all the wickedness in this nation. So here this prophecy that God gives Ezekiel concerns the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians. And we've mentioned that based on chapter 20, uh, this event is about four years away. The current king that was time during Ezekiel's prophecy was King Zedekiah. Uh, now what, what, what fact do we know about King Zedekiah? I'm going to ask that question later in the lesson. So if you answer it right. His eyes put out. Yeah. He was, he was, his eyes were put out, yes. But what else do we know about him? He was what? He rebelled. he rebelled. What other thing? We're going to get into it later. I'm not going to give you the answer now. But we're going to get into about this king. There was one particular fact about this king. So we're going to look at that in a little bit later. So in Jeremiah chapter 52, verse 3, the Bible is clear. For through the anger of the Lord it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah till he had cast them out from his presence, that King Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Now what was the Lord's will concerning this thing? They were going to go into captivity. They Correct, but King Zedekiah was commanded to do what by the prophet Jeremiah in regards to the king of Babylon? Not to fight them. Correct. Yeah, not to fight them, but to submit. Mm -hmm. That was the message from the Lord. But they did not want to submit. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army against Jerusalem and pitched against it and built forts against it round about. So God told him to submit. He refused to submit. Therefore now God says, I'm against you, and God will judge the land because of the inhabitants. And here in, in this chapter, in this, uh, especially in verse 3, we are introduced to the Lord's sword. Now the Lord has a sword, and this sword is both physical and spiritual. God has a sword, it's both physical and spiritual. Who knows what the spiritual sword of the Lord is? The Word of God. That's the Word of God. It's called the sword. Uh, the first time we are introduced to the Lord's sword is in Numbers chapter 22, verse 23. And the ass saw that the angel of the Lord was standing in the way, 
and his sword drawn in his hand. So the Lord was going to slay the prophet, his own prophet, because Balaam, even though he was a pagan, well, not a pagan, but he was a Gentile at that time, he was still the prophet of the Lord. Well, what happened to him at the end of his days? He got greedy, and he went after money, and he uh, fell from the, the Lord's grace. And the Lord drew his own sword because he was going to smite the prophet because he disobeyed him. He disobeyed him. You cannot disobey the Lord and get away with it. Uh, God takes obedience seriously. I teach my kids that obedience is, say it again loud, obedience is not an option. That's what I teach my children. And you, what do you think God th wants from us? Obedience. That's what he wants. And many Christians wonder why they're hurting, why their lives are such a mess. It's because you're not obeying the Lord. One preacher heard, I heard years ago, he said, trust and obey. If every Christian would learn these two simple words, his life would, be, would, would go well. Learn to trust the Lord in all things and learn to obey the Lord. And if you do those two things, I'm not saying you're not going to have any trouble spots, any trials, because God wants to try your faith, but you know what? You'll be in good grace with the Lord. So we will see that in this chapter, as we progress in the chapter, we'll see the Lord is changing from the destruction of the current destruction. When I'm saying current destruction, I'm talking about the time that we are reading in, to a future destruction of Israel. And you'll see that uh, we're going to look at what, what is called in the Bible a double prophecy in a moment here. So the events of this chapter go beyond the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and also speak about a future time. In Revelation chapter 19 verse 5 we read, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he would smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness, and the wrath of God. And you're going to see this event being described here in this chapter. We may not get to it. We're not going to get to it tonight. But we will get to it next week's lesson. But we're going to see the beginnings of how the chapter is turning from the present time, which is the time of Ezekiel, to a future time. And we're going to see how that slowly uh, manifests itself in the rest of the chapter. Revelation 19.21 And the remnant were slain with a sword. You see again the sword? of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with her flesh. So you're going to see the sword of God equals judgment. Equals judgment. Now, sometimes when you read the Old Testament, you'll find out that when Old Testament prophets prophesied, they couldn't tell whether they were prophesied, prophesying of either the first or second coming of Christ. And many times you will see in the same verse that both advents of Christ were prophesied, and the prophet himself had no idea to distinguish which one he was talking about. But we do today. 20, what did they say, 2020? Hindsight is 2020, right? Remember that, that phrase? So I'm going to give you a few examples. And what we call this is the mountain peaks of prophecy. We, we discussed this, uh, this scriptural principle in uh, Lesson 3 when we studied the book of Revelation. So I'm going to give you two examples of this. The first thing, I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2. And I'm going to show you how the prophet prophesies this event. And we'll see that when Christ quotes this verse, he stops. He doesn't quote the entire verse. Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to blind up the, uh, bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma. So right here, you'll see that Christ quotes this verse. We're going to look at that in a moment. And he stops right there. And then he closes the book. But the prophet doesn't stop there. The prophet says, And the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. So I'm going to ask you a question. Who is he going to comfort who is mourning? Book of Zechariah, I'm giving you a hint. Who's going to be mourning and who will Christ comfort? The Jews, why? They're going to be mourning what? Because they crucified Christ. And they're going to realize at that moment that, they're going to, that they realize when they see Christ and they're going to realize that they crucified Him. And the Bible says they're going to be mourning. And here Christ says, I'm going to comfort all those who mourn. Now if you look at uh, Luke chapter 4, we'll read it there. I'm going to read Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. You'll see that when Christ quotes this passage, he doesn't quote it completely. 
Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath set me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. So why didn't he continue on quoting the entire passage? Why did Christ all of a sudden decide to stop halfway through Isaiah 61, verse 2, and he just closed the book? So, partially about his first coming. Exactly, exactly. Because Christ, his first coming, dealt until the comma. But the prophet did not know that. And that's why many times when Christ came, what were the Jews expecting? Expecting him to be king. That's right. They were expecting to crown him king. In fact, there was a plot passage of scripture. They were actually going to forcibly take him and make him king after he fed the 5,000. But he passed through the midst. So we call this... Uh, the mountain peaks of prophecy. The Old Testament prophets, prophets prophesied and they did not know the distinction between the first and second coming of Christ. There's another example, a great example, found in Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 it says, But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me. And look what the prophet says, that is to be ruler of Israel whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, Christ came to Bethlehem, that's correct. He was born in Bethlehem. But did he ever become the ruler of Israel while he was walking the earth? No. Yeah. You see how the prophet prophesied both comings of Christ in one verse? And he didn't even take a pause. He didn't even take a breath. No comma, nothing. He just continued on. And that's why many times the Jews were confused because the fact that Christ would come and die for the sins of the world was hidden to them. When Christ was telling his disciples that he would be, he would be delivered up to the, uh, to the authorities and, and be killed, what did the disciples say? Far be, far, far be it from thee. This is not going to happen. We're going to fight for you, Lord. We're not going to let you be arrested. We're not going to let them put you to death. Because they didn't understand that Christ had to go to the cross. They didn't understand it. Even the disciples did. Now when we get to verse 25 and 27, which we won't get through this evening, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a flavor of what this chapter deals with, is a prophecy against the Antichrist typified by Zedekiah. Now there's a many, many types of the Antichrist in the Bible, and Zedekiah was one of them. And Christ says in these, uh, God says through the prophet in these verses, that his crown will be given to Christ. God will come and take the kingdoms of this world from the Antichrist and give them to Christ. That you'll see that in Ezekiel 21, verse 25 through 27. And we know this is going to happen because Revelation 11:15 15 tells us, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, and shall reign forever and ever. So we're going to see that in the rest of the chapter. But up until now, we've been studying the book of Ezekiel, and every time you look at God's judgment upon the city and its inhabitants, he was excluding those who sigh for the wickedness of the, uh, of the city and the abomination of the city. And even in, uh, I believe in Ezekiel chapter, what was it, chapter 6 or chapter 9, where they mark the righteous, the righteous of the city were marked. But here God says he's going to exclude the righteous from his judgment. So why would God do such a thing that now his anger has reached the point where he says he's going to judge the city and the righteous and the wicked would die together? Now, is that, does that seem fair to us, that God would do such a thing? Would you think that's fair, like from a, humanly speaking? You'd say, as a human being, again, we, we have to see things through, through God's perspective, we say, why would God do such a thing? Why would God allow the righteous to die? When God's judgment would come against the nation, it would be against specific individuals, but this time, he says, he's going to judge the entire nation. Both righteous and the wicked would be taken by the sword of the Lord. Now, think about the flood. When the flood came, would you agree with me that many innocent children died in the flood? Would you agree that infants that were two, three years of age died with the flood? Now, why would you think they would die with the flood? Whose fault is it? The parents' fault. Do you see what responsibility the parents hold? Now, I'm not saying those innocent children didn't go to heaven, because the Bible teaches that if a child dies in the age, what we call the age of, below the age of accountability, if he's innocent, He's going to go to heaven. That's what I believe the Bible teaches that. But you see how responsible the parents are for the children's souls? Yes? So there's a theory about contaminated DNA of people and children, and even the animals at that time, so they would wipe them all out, knowing them or not. 
I, I heard about that. I heard about that, but I believe that DNA was contaminated only by some people, and uh, that was the the sons of God, who I believe were fallen angels, came and took up human flesh. That's what I believe, and I also believe that the the, the offspring produced by those that union was didn't have a spirit, no soul, no spirit, just like Jude tells us. They are clouds without water, without spirit. So whatever was born between that union had no soul, because God did not sanction the union. That's that's. That's what I think. Now, some people say that DNA and only no was found, quote unquote, perfect. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how far I could. I have no more evidence in the scripture to to hold that opinion. But I've heard that people suggest that they say that no, only no was found perfect in all his generations, meaning that Noah had only Noah had perfect DNA. But then look at his wife. Who did she descend from? Was her DNA marred? He was the only one that was perfect. What would we say about his wife's DNA? That to me, that doesn't. I understand it, but it doesn't make it doesn't make full full sense. So, if all the DNA was contaminated, let's just chase the squirrel for a few seconds. Mm -hmm. Then, why would God give people 120 years? Why would Noah preach righteousness for 120 years? He just he would have destroyed the whole whole world then and there. And instead, why did Noah build such a massive ark? The whole world. Chance, chance exactly. God gave them 120 years, but they still refused to repent. So that, that theory doesn't hold too much water with me. I understand it. I've read about it, but it just it's hard for me to, to, to accept it. Hopefully that answers that, partially answers that question. Now, sometimes when God takes the righteous, he does so for reasons unknown to us. We may not like it. We may think it's unjust as human beings. But God gives us an answer in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 1 and 2. And I believe this is why the, region, the, the reason why God said he would take both the righteous and the wicked in his judgment. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 1 and verse 2. The righteous perish. You see that? The righteous perish. And no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering. And here's the answer. Don't miss it. That the righteous is taken away from evil to come. He shall enter into peace, referring to the righteous, but they shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. So what God does is sometimes he takes the righteous away because he is sparing them from something worse to come. King Josiah is a perfect example. King Josiah died in his prime. He, was, he, was, he died in battle. But I believe God was merciful to Josiah to take him away so Josiah wouldn't see what would come of the city. Now here when God says he taketh the righteous, it doesn't mean they were going to die and go to hell. It just means that their lives will be taken so that they would be spared from further turmoil and further trials. But sometimes it's God's mercy that he does that. And we did mention the fact about the flood that many innocent children died because their parents refused passage on the ark. And uh, pa parents be bear great responsibility upon the children. I teach this, and if you've been with us for any length of time, you'll see that I believe that parents who do not spank the children, what do they do? They risk the souls of the children going to hell. When I read that verse when I was a young man, and I read, I couldn't understand spanking. Now, I'm not against it, because I ask my, my children if I'm against it. But when I read that verse, it says, if you, if you do not spare the rod, you will... If you spank your kids, you're going to spare them from hell. I took that verse to heart. I took that verse to heart. Many parents say, oh, I'm not going to spank little Johnny. I'm not going to spank little Susan. But if you read the verse, it says, if you do so, you'll spare them. You'll save them from hell. You'll save the soul from hell. What do you think you're going to do as a parent? Now, it doesn't mean spanking kids equals heaven. No. But it means you're going to direct your kids to the path where they will get saved. I believe if a man and if a man and woman, if parents do what's right, guess what? Guess who's, guess who's going to get saved? Their children are going to get saved. Because I believe in the authority of the house. God has placed man, and if you get, if you're a young man, you're planning to get getting married, or if you're a young family and you're starting off, uh, there is uh, the, the authority of the house is given to the man. And what does society want to do today? They want to remove that. They want to strip that authority from the man. And if you don't take your God-given authority, then you're giving the authority to who? Don't think you're giving it to your wife. Because wherever there is a vacuum of authority, who steps in? The enemy. The enemy. And who's the enemy? Satan. 
Whenever there's a vacuum in authority, the devil steps in. People talk about, oh, we need to remove it. now. We, we need to remove God from government. If you remove God from government, who's going to step in? The devil. And who is running our country today? What are these people called? Do you guys know what these people are called? It begins with an L. Luciferians. Luciferians. Who's heard of them? Luciferians. You know who are Luciferians? The Masons. Who's heard of the Masons? They're all Luciferians. And our government is filled with what? Masons. Masons. And who, they believe Lucifer is the right true God. Read about it. Our government is filled with them. So you remove God, devil's going to come in. That was free, by the way. I'm not going to charge you extra for that. Look into it. Look into it. Your, uh, Trump is what? Do you know who Trump is? Do you know what he is? What type of Mason is he? Scottish Freemason. Look it up. He's a Scottish Freemason. Bill Clinton was... A, they're all Masons. The Bushes are Masons. The, what is that club in that... The Owl Club, what was it called? Skull and Bones. You heard of the Skull and Bones? They're all Masons. Look into it. Well, there are Masons on both sides. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the, and the Freemasons and the Scottish Freemasons are fighting it out to see whose worldview is going to come to pass. Anyways, I'm going to stop on that because I'll, I'll go on and on about that. And you can say, what about the lesson? <laughs> Thank you, Caesar. Sometimes Caesar tells me to stop and it's good. All right, let's continue on. So, uh, during last week's lesson, we discovered that how the forest fire of Ezekiel, that's why I have notes, because you see, if I don't have notes, I'm just going to go all over the place. Get thee behind me, squirrel, is what I say. So, during last week's lesson, we discovered how the forest fire of Ezekiel in chapter 20 will become the unquenchable fire of eternal punishment for the wicked during the millennial kingdom. And that this fire will be kindled when the Lord returns towards the end of the tribulation. And the second advent theme now will find its way into this chapter. And you're going to see now as God is talking about the judgment of, of Jerusalem and her inhabitants. He's going to start introducing this millennial kingdom stuff slowly into the chapter. 21 verse 6. Sigh therefore thou son of man with the breaking of thy loins and with bitterness sigh before their eyes. And it shall be when they say unto thee, Wherefore sighest thou that thou shalt answer for the tidings? So Ezekiel's going to sigh because of this, this horrible news. Because it cometh, and every heart shall melt, and all hands shall be feeble, and every spirit shall faint, and all the knees shall be weak as water. Behold, it cometh, and it shall be brought to pass, saith the Lord God. So God tells Ezekiel to sigh this time. What is a sigh? <sighs> when you hear bad news, what do you do? You either slap yourself in the face, or you take a deep sigh. So God tells Ezekiel, this time your loins will break. What is that? When you hear bad news, what happens to some people? Horrible news. They fall at the waist and they collapse. Ezekiel's loins would be, would be broken at the news. Ezekiel, God tells Ezekiel, you'll do this with bitterness. That is, Ezekiel's going to become disappointed at the news. Think about it. Who would be happy if today someone would come to you in a hypothetical situation and say, America is going to be destroyed tomorrow? Would you rejoice? You would rejoice if it would happen in another state. But you wouldn't rejoice if it happened in your, in your you town. Both, well, was that? You'd hightail it out of there if you're fast enough. So God was going to make, and here I want to park here for a little bit. God was going to make Ezekiel feel what he is feeling. You never forget that God has feelings. Never forget that. And as a Christian, one of the greatest experiences you can live through, it's not speaking in tongues or saying mumbo jumbo, which doesn't exist anymore, by the way. The greatest thing you can experience as a Christian, if God allows you to feel what he feels, if God shows you how, how he hates sin, if God shows you how his heart breaks over the souls, if God shows you how much He loves people, that's the greatest thing as a Christian that you can experience. And God is going to tell us, He's telling Ezekiel, Ezekiel, are you going to feel what I'm feeling right now, Ezekiel? You're going to see that I take no pleasure in what I'm about to do. That's basically what He is saying. You, you hear these people, you see, and, 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 and I'm not trying to offend you here, but if you get offended, well, I'm not, I'm not doing it on purpose. You see all these charismatics, and all they want to do is what? 
They want to speak in tongues. The gift of tongues is seized. Read, read history. Read the Bible. Uh, they want to be baptized by fire. Who's heard that? Lord, baptize me. I've heard him, I've heard him pray this. Baptize me by fire. What is the baptism of fire? Who knows? Well, hell. Hell. Who defines that? He, sh he shall gather the wheat into his barns, and he shall burn the chaff with fire. He shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, and with fire. And then the Bible self-interprets. You don't want to be baptized with fire. You want to be baptized by the Holy Ghost, and that happens when you get saved. It's not a subsequent second experience. I had that. We, we had a few people come over here, and I think one time I preached that, and never came back. They never came back again. You know what I want to experience as a Christian? I want to experience how God loves. That's what I want to experience. How does God love? How does God hate sin? How does God want people to get saved? That's what I want to experience. And that's what we should all want to experience as Christians. And God assures the prophet that when his judgment comes, uh, people will have their hearts melt, their hands will be feeble, they shall faint, their knees will buckle. But there's tragedy found in the reaction of what God was going to do. And when the armies of Babylon came, this time when they came through Jerusalem, they literally raised the city to the ground. They burned almost houses with fire, they destroyed the temple they literally raised the city to the ground chapter 21 verse 8 again this is the third uh, part of the prophecy the first part began at the end of chapter 20 again the word of the lord came unto me saying son of man prophecy and say thus saith the lord say a sword a sword is sharpened and also furbished it is a sharpened to make sore slaughter it is furbished that it may glitter should we then make mirth? Now, if you read this passage casually, you're going to miss what God says here. It contemneth the rod of my son. You see that there? Mm -hmm. The rod of my son as every tree. Now, I've taught you before, and I'm going to repeat it again. What do you think happened with this statement? The rod of my son. It is destroyed in many versions. Look it up. It is destroyed in many versions. In fact, certain versions mess with this verse, and all modern versions mess with the deity of Christ. And I give you a whole slew of references, just, just a scattering. And if you are an honest student, you will look at these verses, and you'll see that all these modern versions, and I teach you this, I'm not embarrassed to say this, I'm not ashamed to say this, they all mess with the deity of Christ, at some point or another. And this verse here, whenever you come across... The Bible, when the Bible speaks about the devil or the Bible speaks of the deity of Christ, you can put money on it. I'm not a betting man. I don't believe in betting. But if I was a betting man, hypothetically speaking, guaranteed. I don't even have to look at them. I didn't have to look at it. I said, guaranteed. I said, this verse, when I came across this phrase, the rod of my son, who is God talking about here? Jesus Christ. The rod, who, who is God's son? Christ. The rod of my son, I said, Guaranteed they mess with some versions mess mess with this verse and I checked it. Guess what my hunch was? Correct. And here's a list of all the other verses. This is just a scattering of how they mess or attack the deity of Jesus Christ. Again, I don't want to get into that this, this evening because there'll be another squirrel we're going to chase. So let's continue on. Verse 11 of chapter 21. And he hath given it to the furbished that it may be handled. This sword is sharpened. It is furbished to give it to the hand of the slayer. Now, this is God speaking. Don't forget that this is God speaking through the prophet. Howl, cry, and howl, son of man, for it shall be upon my people, it shall be upon all the princes of Israel, terrors by reason of the sword shall be upon my people, smite therefore upon thy thigh, because it is a trial. And what if the sword contemn even the rod? It shall be no more, saith the Lord God. Therefore, son of man, Prophesy and smite thine hands together and let the sword be doubled the third time. The third time. We'll see what that means. The sword of the slain. It is a sword of the great men that are slain, which entereth in their privy chambers. I have set the point of the sword against all their gates, that their heart may faint and their ruins be multiplied. Ah, it is made bright. It is wrapped up for the slaughter. God is saying this. Think about this. Try to picture how God is speaking. He's saying, finally, 
the sword is ready for the slaughter. This is God speaking. Go thee one way or other, either on the right hand or on the left, whithersoever thy face is set. Basically, you're going to try to run away, but guess what? It's going to catch up to you. I will also smite my hands together, and I will cause my fury to rest. I, the Lord, have said it. Now, God is telling this prophet that the sword is going to be sharpened and furbished. What does furbished mean? It's another word for highly polished. Furbished means highly polished. So God is saying, I am preparing the sword. I am preparing the sword. The sword is sharpened so that it can kill more effectively and efficiently. Have you guys seen the Japanese swords, the katana swords? They can actually slice through a bamboo that's about three inches thick. You know how hard a bamboo is? Have you ever tried to cut a bamboo with just a regular knife? And those katana swords slice through it like it was butter. And the word that we the word that we have here, slaughter, is translated from a Hebrew word, which is often used to refer to the slaughtering or the killing of animals. So basically, God is foretelling to the prophet that the enemy is going to kill indiscriminately. He won't care who's in front of him, that he's going to kill. The, the sword is polished so that it can be presentable to the person who's going to hold it. It is so polished that it glitters, it catches the light. And, and God says, when you're going to hear of what's going to happen, no one's going to rejoice about it. Now we mentioned the fact that verse 10 says that the rod of my son, and this is a very important verse, God tells us that he has a son, and that his son has a rod. Now when you see both these words in the Old Testament, the rod and the son together, what comes to mind? End times. Exactly. End times. What more, and again, if we, if, we, if we were to expand that, what more in particular? you got to speak a little louder. He's ruling over the nations with a what? With a rod of iron. You see that? And we're going to see that in a moment. So, you're going to see the rod and the sun is connected. Revelation chapter 2, verse 27, And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I receive my son. And you will find this connection between the rod and the son again in Psalms chapter 2. His father, I might, as I received of my father, because I'm looking ahead. Uh, son, in Psalms chapter 2, which is a messianic psalm, again you will see the connection between the son and the rod. Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, look at that. I will declare the decree, the Lord saith, Thou art my son. You see that? Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like potter's vessel. And in Psalms 2.12, kiss the son, lest he be angry. Now when's Christ going to be angry if you don't kiss him? When he's the king. When Christ is king, if you don't kiss him, you'll be angry. So when you see the rod and the son together in the Bible, you know it's definitely talking about the second coming of Christ. And what is this rod going to do? It's going to condemn the trees. Now, I know here I mentioned the fact that I didn't go over it, but in, in, in the, or King James, the word order is a little different. But if you look at the, uh, the Hebrew word order, it says, the rod of my son condemns every tree. Now, the words are translated right, but the order is, the order is a little off. So when is the rod going to condemn every tree? Does that, does that give you any clues when the rod is going to condemn a tree? What is a tree in the Bible? People. So when is the rod going to condemn the trees? The second coming. Mark chapter 8 verse 24 tells us that men are as trees. Men are as trees. So you see the trees and the forest and the rod again in Isaiah chapter 10. Now the Bible is written in such a way that when you study it, you have to study it very carefully. Sometimes you get bored and you, read, you glance over it and you miss these things. But just keep reading and the Holy Spirit will show them to you. Isaiah chapter 10 is another prophetic chapter and it gives us a perfect example how God begins a chapter and he's talking about current events and as you progress through the chapter God switches and he talks about the end times. Now we're not going to go through the entire chapter of Isaiah, of, uh, of Isaiah chapter 10 but go back home and read it and you'll see how God begins talking about the Assyrian, the actual king of Assyria and by the time you finish the chapter you, you, you scratch your head and says, He's talking about the Antichrist. 
Now, what does the Antichrist call in the Bible? The Assyrian. The Assyrian. He's called the Assyrian. You'll see that many Old Testament prophecies are actual double prophecies. What do we mean by that? Uh, these prophecies, we call them dual fulfillment or double fulfillment. That is, the prophecy is only partially fulfilled by a current event. The fullness of the prophecy or the complete prophecy will not be fulfilled until the future event also takes place. Mm -hmm. So God judges the king of Assyria in Isaiah chapter 10. And then as you continue reading the chapter, he, he, judges the, he continues judging the Assyrian. But you come away saying, this is not the king, can't be the king. Because it tells us that God's going to take the crown from his king and give it to his son. So it can't be the king of Assyria. And God, and it, and it switches so gradually, if you don't pay, if you don't pay attention, you, you'll miss it. In Isaiah chapter 10, again, I'll give you an example. I'll show you some verses here. God is speaking about the king of Assyria. And then by the time you come to verse 16, you definitely know that you're reading about the second coming of Christ. I'll give you a, an example here. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 16. Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send among his fat ones leanness, and under his glory he shall kindle a burning fire like a burning of a fire. Now we know that Christ will kill the Antichrist for the brightness of his coming. Look at Isaiah chapter 10, verse 17. And the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. And it shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. Now who is this holy one? Christ. Who is the holy one in the Bible? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So here in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 17, and it's, it's talking about the holy one. Now I'll give you all uh, several references in the New Testament where you know that the Holy One is the Lord Jesus Christ, and that one day is the day of the Lord. And look at Isaiah chapter 10, verse 18. And if you think where we're going with all this, hopefully it will make the connection for you. And he shall consume the glory of his forest. You see that? He's going to consume the glory of his forest and his fruitful field, both soul and body, and they shall be as when a standard bearer fainteth. And that day people are going to faint when they see the Lord come upon the earth. They're going to faint. Men's hearts shall fail them, the Bible says. When they see Christ, and he's going to set the forest on fire. And that's how we spent quite a bit of time last week, so you should know what this means. The, the, the south right now is pretty dry in Israel, and also in the southwest Jordan. But that is going to be the place where Christ is going to first land when he comes. We mentioned, we looked at the path that Christ takes at the second coming. He doesn't land immediately in the Mount of Olives. He, he takes a route. He starts in the south and he goes north. And then the final location where he stands and stops is at the Mount of Olives. And you find out all that in the Old Testament. You just got to study it and just got to look at it. It's, it's all in there. And look at Isaiah chapter 10 verse 19. And the rest of the trees of his forest shall be few that a child may write them. Now what do we know about the sec after the tribulation? What will happen? After the second coming of Christ, what what does the Bible say about men? <coughs> I, I can't hear you. There won't be many. They'll be rare as the gold of Ophir. You've read that in the Bible? That's what it's talking about. It's talking about at the end of the tribulation, after Christ is done, after Christ comes back in the second coming, there won't be many people left on the earth. The trees of his forest shall be few. And if you're not convinced, look at chapter verse 20 of Isaiah chapter 10. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob, we talked about that last week, shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. You see that? Who is the Holy One again? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. They will stay upon him. Israel will no longer be moved from their land once the Lord comes back during the second coming of Christ. So now you can, I went through all this to show you the connection between the forest, the trees, the rod, and the sun. So hopefully you have a clear picture in your mind what this all is talking about. Now you'll read some commentators and they'll tell you that uh, where Ezekiel says, my son, he was talking about Zedekiah. Now we mentioned again, what is one fact about Zedekiah that we should all know? Rebel. What was that? He rebelled. he rebelled, yes, but one more, a very important fact. Who was the last king of Judah according to God? The guy who came before him. And who was the guy who came before him? Jeconiah. 
also known as Kanaya and Jehoiakim. Matthew chapter 1 verse 12. See you can find Zedekiah's name in that lineage. You can't. Because Zedekiah was not the last king according to God. The last king was Jehoiakim because Zedekiah was placed on the throne by who? Nebuchadnezzar as his vassal, as his servant. And God never acknowledged the authority of Zedekiah. So that's the other important fact about Zedekiah. In fact, he's not even found in the lineage of Christ. Jeconiah is the last king. There's a prophecy regarding Jeconiah. What is it? Who knows what it is? No man shall sit coming from his loins shall sit upon the throne. Right? But then you say, well, if no one from Jeconiah's line can sit upon the throne, then what about Christ? What do we do with Christ? So the question is, where does Christ's physical line come from? Can't hear you. David. David. And then who? Solomon. And then who after that? Nathan. Comes from the line of Nathan. Just ahead, look it up. In, in uh, the lineage of Jesus Christ. Christ has a, has a physical line and it does not come from, it comes from Nathan, it does not come from Solomon. Look it up. So, God says, no one from the seed of Jeconiah will sit on the throne. You see that? Because of all those kings, they did not keep the words of the Lord, the word of the Lord. So it comes from the line of Nathan. Look it up. So here, God commands Ezekiel to strike his hands together. And it's a sign of encouragement for the sword. Like when you want somebody to encourage someone, what do you do? You clap, you cheer them on. God is saying to Ezekiel, cheer up the sword. And he says, the sword shall be doubled the third time. Doubled the third time. Now, why the third time? Because this would be the third time that Nebuchadnezzar invades Jerusalem. He invaded them through the when Jehoiakim was king. He invaded them again when Jehoiakim was king. And the third and final time is going to be when Zedekiah is king. And God wants to use Nebuchadnezzar to cause his fury to rest. God is directing the sword. And he's even directing the thrust of the blade. And God says that he will not cease until his fury is rested. So God's anger towards sin must be satisfied. And that's why Christ had to come to die. God had to satisfy his anger and wrath against sin. And God uses whomever he will to accomplish his will. God will use a devil. He use your family members. He will even use your flesh to accomplish his will. And that's why I believe this. Every Christian needs to stay right with God. And you have some, some Christians that don't realize uh, that the importance of being in the center of God's will. You do not want God to punish you for being out of his will. Because you don't know how heavy his sword is going to be against you. You do not know how heavy God's hand is going to be against you when you're out of the Lord's will. Because what does the Bible tells us, tell us about God? He does what to us? He chastens us. Why does he chasten us? Get right. That's right. He wants us to get right with Him. And above all, He loves us. Mm -hmm. The reason why I believe some parents can't spank their kids is because they don't really love them. Oh, I love my kids. No, you don't. Because if you love them, you would obey what God tells you to do to your children. Raise them up in the admonition and nurture of the Lord. But when that little Johnny or little Susan is acting up, apply the Board of Education on the seat of knowledge. The Jews in Zedekiah, the Ezekiel in Jeremiah's days, even Zedekiah himself, refused to obey the Lord. God gave him clear commandments. Because of your sin, you're going to serve King Nebuchadnezzar. And a lot of people have a problem with authority. And that's one problem I see in society today. No one wants to admit to authority. Everybody wants to be their own, their own man, their own person, their own individual. I have seen men, uh, I've been a Christian long enough, and I've, seen, I've been in many churches, and I've seen... Men destroy their families. Why? Because they couldn't submit to pastoral authority. They couldn't submit to the pastor. Why? Because they wanted to be the pastor. Why, why, are, why am I not the pastor? If God has called you to be a pastor, then do it. Do it. Don't wait. But if God has not called you to be a pastor, you find a church, you go to your like, and you submit to pastoral authority. I've seen many men destroy their families because they could not submit to authority. You have to submit to the authority that God has placed over you. Children are supposed to submit to who? The parents, wives are supposed to submit to who? 
Now, when the, the liberal media, when you tell them women are supposed to submit to men, what are they, what's, what's the thing that they, they throw at you? You misogynist, you, you abuse women, you want to take your woman, put an apron on her, stick her in the kitchen, get her pregnant, leave her there. That's what they accuse you of. They accuse you of beating the, the wife. God says men are supposed to love their wives as Christ loved the church, willing to die for their wives. So they have a twisted sense of what authority is. The world's going to lie to you. The devil's going to lie to you. Even your own heart will lie to you. And that's why you have to be intimate with the Word of God. You have to in be intimate with Scripture. And the more Scripture you put, and that's why we go through detailed, detailed Bible studies, because the more of this Bible you put inside you, what are you, doing, what are you allowing the Holy Spirit to do? The more Bible stories, the more reading, the more memorizing, the more meditating. When there's going to come a point when you mature as a Christian, the Holy Spirit's going to guide you how? He's going to guide you by bringing these things that you have learned and read into remembrance. He's going to tell you, uh, you remember that guy over there that you read about in that book over there? You're acting just like him. And you know what happened to him? That's what he's going to do. You won't know what to do and God's going to bring a verse to you. He's going to say, this is what you're going to do. That's why the Bible is so important. And you have to prepare your heart to seek the Lord. We, we spend a deal of time in a, in a lesson back. Uh, uh, teaching the importance of preparing your heart to seek God. Because if you do not prepare your heart to seek God, guess who's going to come and uh, lie to you? You're going to be more susceptible to lies. God, at the end, I want to end with this, that when God's wrath needs to be fulfilled, God will relish dishing out the punishment. And there's a fact, a, a very verse that upset some people, and I believe it's in the book of Proverbs, that says God will laugh when the calamity comes upon them. When God draws a line in the sand and you cross it, God's going to say, it's on you. Hebrews chapter 10, I want to end with these verses. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30 and 31. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And the Jews are going to get to find out, the Jews of Ezekiel's day and Jeremiah's day, what it means to fall into the hand of God. So we'll end it there. Is there any uh, comments or questions? Uh, anybody that, that is going to keep you from sleeping tonight? Feel free. If not, we're going to continue in chapter 21 next week. And it gets, it gets very interesting in chapter 21 of next week as we get more and more into the uh, millennial type uh, theme of the book and you're going to see more and more of that as we get towards the end of the book any other questions or comments if not well see you back same time same place next week